Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Erebus and also to hear so many inspirational speeches today across the House and in particular uh, uh, the speech made by my Honourable Friend, the Member for Birmingham and, and Yardley in her moving tribute uh, to the victims of violence uh, in our country. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's fitting that we should mark International Women's Day in the 100th anniversary of the representation of the, People's, uh, of the People Act 1918. Uh, my constituency has had a proud history of women being pioneers uh, for fighting for women's rights and workers' rights, going back to the match women's strikes of 1888. Uh, to, the, to establishing the East London Federation of Suffragettes led by Sylvia Pankhurst, which was based in Bow with branches all over the East End. They grounded their uh, campaign in, everyday, in the everyday reality of working women's lives and fought for a living wage, decent housing, equal pay, uh, food price controls, adequate pensions and much else. The suffragettes saw the vote as just one aspect of the struggle for equality, and while it, it was important, an important step towards equality, it represented a partial, not complete victory, as others have already pointed out. We, are, we, have, we owe a huge amount to them for having the opportunity to stand here today and speak in this debate and make a contribution to public life in our country and internationally. And, but while much progress has been made since then, we have so much more to do, as others have pointed out already, whether it's women's status, safety, rights, pay or representation. And Madam Deputy Speaker, I am incredibly proud of the fact that I am one of three Muslim women to have ever got elected in 2010 here in this parliament, uh, along with uh, my honourable friends Yasmin Qureshi and Shabana Mahmoud. And I'm proud of the fact that many other women, Muslim women and women from other faith backgrounds and BAME backgrounds have entered parliament across the house. But we have much more to do to increase the number of women, and those from other backgrounds into our parliament. And I just want to pay tribute to the many women here in our parliament who enabled us to get here. The women who were the pioneers who first arrived in this parliament. And I, there are many, but I want to single out two in particular. My Labour predecessor, uh, now a member of the House of Lords, Una King, who is the second black woman MP to have ever got elected into this house. And of course, uh, the former deputy leader of my party, our party, uh, the right honourable member for Camberwell and Peckham, who has, who has done so much for us and for our country and who commands support from across the house, from women across the house. I certainly wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the encouragement and support from, from her and many other women in public life. And I hope that we continue to build on that by ensuring that women have the confidence, the encouragement, the support, the networks, the backup to, to charge ahead, to go forward and stand in uh, positions in public life. And that's why I took the step to set up a charity which has the support of different parties, cross-party support, called the Uprising Leadership Charity, to support women as well as men from white working class and ethnic minority backgrounds, but particularly women, to enter public life in the professions, but also, and particularly, in politics, working in different constituencies, so that the next generation have the support and don't have to struggle the way that previous generations have done so. Many will be aware of stories and I have of their own, will have their own stories and I have some stories of my own of the number of times uh, um, I was told you can't do that because people won't support a woman when I decided to stand for parliament. The audacity to stand is still a challenge for many women because too often they're told that 
they can't make it, they won't make it, they won't have the support of people in their communities or they won't have the support of men. And it's when women push forward and stand, as I did and others did, uh, that it shows that those preconceptions and prejudices are actually wrong. And that's why we must continue to encourage young women today, despite all the abuses online and much else, despite what we've seen in the past year of stories of abuse and injustice, that they can stand for public life, for positions in politics locally and nationally. And so I hope that we can all continue to work together in that effort. And as we have heard today, uh, while we have achieved a great deal, the focus on progress um, can, must continue. And progress comes with pressure. And as we've seen in the last year, some of the stories through the Me Too campaign and, and many other campaigns of the plight of women in countries where we shouldn't expect women to suffer the, the way they have done, we have much to do. And Madam Deputy Speaker, around the world, women continue to bear the brunt of poverty, of war, of sexual violence, and of climate change. There are 130 million girls not in education, and 15 million girls of primary school age will never get the chance to learn to read or write in primary school. And globally, more than a third of women are subject to violence. 750 million women and girls are married before the age of 18. And women t today still face the brunt far too often in conflicts around the world. They've been exposed to brutal attacks, often as deliberate tools of political and ethnic violence. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, women are far more likely than soldiers to be victims of violence. In Sudan, in South Sudan, rape has been used as a weapon of war by both government and opposition forces. And a report published by the International Rescue Committee last year stated that the scale of violence against women and girls in South Sudan is double the global average. I'll give way to my, uh, the right honorable. I think she's making a really important point. Um, we also know that the longer term consequences of these actions, that the, the children in those communities grow up seeing violence around them and then domestic violence rates, even when peace has happened in those countries, are way higher than in other countries around the world. So it's vital that she, she makes that point and I think she's quite right to do so. I thank uh, the Honourable Member, Right Honourable Member, for her contribution and also the work that she did as International Development Secretary. Uh, and I, as uh, someone who served uh, in the, as a Shadow International Development Minister, uh, we cannot, um, I cannot uh, can stop being affected by uh, the experience of women in conflict zones and other parts of the world. The ongoing crisis in Syria has forced the displacement of millions of women who have fled to other countries in the hope of safety, uh, but who, as she points out, continue to experience violence uh, long after they fled the instability in their own countries. Those women now living in temporary refugee, refugee settlements in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan and elsewhere have very limited access to support and live in constant fear of further violence and forced marriage. I give way to the Honourable Member. Yeah, and I think it's a very powerful point that you're making. Would the Honourable Member agree with me that much more should also be done to encourage more women to take part in making peace and a more, greater recognition of the valuable role that women can make uh, in making uh, peace agreements and trying to end conflict? And that has been the case in the history in Northern Ireland where so many women helped in, uh, to bring about the peace that we, we enjoy in Northern Ireland today. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with the Honourable Member and we've seen the important contribution women can make but too often they're left out of those negotiations and we, our government, must continue to push forward on ensuring that they have a strong voice in negotiations for peace. Uh, many girls who, whose lives have already been devastated by the conflict in their own countries are being forced into situations that no child should, should have to face. They are living in cycles of abuse, exploitation and trauma. Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to turn to the situation of the Rohingya women uh, who have uh, fled 
recently from the conflict in Myanmar to Bangladesh. 70% of those who are affected, who've been displaced, are women and children. And the United Nations has identified what has happened there as a textbook example of ethnic cleansing and that genocide cannot be ruled out. And it's increasingly apparent that the Burmese military has systematically used rape and violence against Rohingya women as part of their campaign of terror. They've torched villages and tortured civilians, especially women. According to a UN report, girls aged as young as five or seven were raped, often in front of their relatives, sometimes by three to five men, all dressed in army uniforms, taking turns. The report goes on to detail accounts of summary executions, cases of torture and disappearances. I visited uh, the region a number of times in recent years and spoke to refugees who have fled violence and who have shared the stories of rape and violence against them. And, and as the world watches on, we must make sure our government ensures that those who have prosecuted the violence, the Burmese military, are held to account and that a referral is made to the International Criminal Court. Madam Deputy Speaker, violence against women is a violation of human rights and we have a collective responsibility to protect women here in this country and around the world from the appalling suffering they face and the implications of that suffering on their children. Britain has a proud history as a leader in international development and we must continue to press for progress. And as other honourable members have already pointed out, the Millennium Development Goals galvanised efforts from countries around the world to meet the needs of the world's poorest and most vulnerable, and particularly women. We must continue to support the Sustainable Development Goals as, as well as encourage other countries to do so. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted by world leaders in 2015 offer a significant opportunity for progress with gender equality and women's empowerment at heart. The first of the SDG goals is to end poverty in all its forms everywhere. And number five of the SDGs is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. I urge ministers uh, across government to champion the need to achieve that and continue to support our aid effort. Madam Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, I just want to share one personal story. I was born in a country, uh, Bangladesh, that was born out of conflict, where millions of people lost their lives. <coughs> and, um, excuse me, where rape uh, and violence was used as a weapon of war. And that continues in many other countries today. We, we must all continue to work hard to make sure that we bring an end to sexual violence in conflicts. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah.